Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name's Brittany. Nice to meet you. So today we're gonna be going over Curly Girl Method myths, and there's a lot of them. These myths are specifically going to focus around ingredients and what you should or should not use on your hair. So we're gonna go through all of that today. But if you have not watched my part one video where I talk about how I got to where I am today, I'm gonna link that one up in the cards. Highly recommend watching that first. Now, if you aren't already subscribed to my channel, here we do all things curly hair. So if you wanna rock your best curls, make sure to tap that subscribe button down below. And don't forget to hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified notified every time I post. Before we get into it, I want to make something very clear, and I mentioned this in the part one video as well. I am not asking you to stop following the Curly Girl method if it works for you. What I am asking is that you stop demonizing ingredients as toxic or bad. Understand that these ingredients can have a place in a healthy hair routine, even if it isn't your hair routine, and accept the fact that we are all laymen without the ability to properly evaluate an ingredients list. And that is why I decided to partner with someone who is very much not a layman and has years and years of credentials and experience to help me go through all of these Curly Girl Method myths and separate fact from fiction. I ended up partnering with Dr. Ginza on Instagram. She is a cosmetic chemist with years and years of experience. So just to give you a little taste, she's a trained and licensed pharmacist with a PhD in pharmaceutical analytical chemistry and over 15 years of research and development in the cosmetics and personal care industry. She's worked for The Body Shop, Cody, Oriflame, Nivea, as well as worked as a lecturer in the field of cosmetic science at multiple universities. Plus, she speaks five languages, so what I'm trying to say is she's a badass. Anki and I worked together on the original post for my Instagram. Before this video, I've included some additional sources to provide you guys with even more context on the myths that we are going to go through today, so stay tuned. All right, let's start with myth number one. Sulfate shampoos should be avoided because all sulfate shampoos are harsh and and drying. So here's the thing. Sulfate shampoos aren't necessarily harsh and drying across the board. It really depends on the formulation. The concentration of the cleansing ingredient really makes a difference. In addition, what else is in the formulation? Is it just a cleanser or are there moisturizing ingredients included in there as well? And sure, there are plenty of sulfate shampoos that can be on the harsher side, but there are sulfate-free shampoos that can be on the harsher side as well. For example, I've heard from many people that Kinky Curly Come Clean, which is a clarifying shampoo, is just way too strong for them. That's a Curly Girl approved product. You might still be using cleansers that are on the stronger side, not just sulfates. So how do you know if a shampoo is too strong, too drying for your hair? First off, I mean, the best thing you can do is buy how it makes your hair feel. So if you wash your hair and you get that super duper squeaky clean feeling, maybe that's a shampoo that you use every once in a while as a deep clean. You can also look at the ingredients list to see if there are other cleansing ingredients present. Sciency Hair Blog, which is one of my favorite hair care sources, actually made a post about how if if a shampoo formulation contains multiple cleansers, then chances are that the formulation is a little bit milder. So that's definitely something to keep an eye out for. In addition, paying attention to what else is in the formulation. So are there moisturizing ingredients included? And lastly, I do pay attention to marketing in this area. So if the shampoo says clarifying, chances are it's a bit stronger than your average shampoo. But if it says gentle or moisturizing, then this is probably a shampoo that is going to be more gentle or moisturizing. So use all these factors to determine whether or not a sulfate shampoo could work for you in your routine. And just to give you guys an idea, I used a sulfate shampoo today. Didn't deep condition, just conditioned as usual. I didn't use a cream today. I actually used two gels and a foam and my hair does not feel dry. It does not feels stiff. In fact, it feels moisturized and smooth. So I'd say this is a pretty good hair day. Alrighty, myth number two. All silicones should be avoided. They build up on the hair, they prevent moisture from getting in, and they can only be removed with drying sulfates. First off, silicones are an immensely large group of molecules. So to say that every single one should be avoided is a really generalized statement. So let's just talk about some different kinds of silicones and what they can do for your hair. First off, many silicones are really, really good at humidity protection. So we mentioned earlier that they prevent moisture from getting in. in 
98% humidity, you might want that. We know that the way that hair frizzes up is by moisture entering the cuticle and making it swell, giving you not a good hair day. Silicones are fantastic frizz fighters, which make them really great on humid days. In addition, different silicones have different properties. So there's water-soluble silicones, the ones that really just wash off with water. There are others that evaporate once the product dries on your hair. There are others that are used as emulsifiers in a formulation. Others that specifically bind to damaged sections of the hair shaft. There are some pretty cool silicones out there. But as I've started talking about silicones more and more on my hair count, what I've noticed is that people are just deathly afraid of buildup. What I say to that is why don't you just clean it off? Pretty simple. Pretty much any moisturizing ingredient has the propensity to build up on your hair. So obviously some more than others, silicones in particular can be a little stickier and difficult to remove. But if you pay attention to how your hair feels and clarify regularly, I don't really think that you should have much of an issue. And it really just comes down to personal experimentation and seeing what works for you. But here's the thing, there are actually more shampoos that remove silicones than you might think. So once again, going to link to a Sciency Hair blog article down below, which has a list of cleansers that can remove silicone buildup. And a fair amount of those cleansers are Curly Girl approved. Get it out of your mind that you have to use sulfates to remove silicone, Keep an open mind. Maybe you don't like a silicone in all of your products, but hey, if your friend recommends a product to you that has a silicone in it, try it out. As you guys know, I've been experimenting with silicones and so far it's been great. I really haven't noticed much buildup and when I do, if my hair feels a little off, I just clarify. Now that being said, I'm not using silicones every time I wash. It's not in my shampoo, conditioner, cream, gel. I'm using them a little bit more sparingly, but so far in my experimentation, that seems to be how my hair likes it best. But once again, it varies by person, so what works best for me might not work best for you. Alrighty, claim number three. I'm gonna read this one off because it's a long list. Waxes, butters, and non-natural oils such as beeswax, shea butter, and mineral oil should be avoided. They build up on the hair and are difficult to remove. So some of you guys might not recognize some of these claims here. You might be saying, wait a second, shea butter's not allowed? So this is actually a new claim from Lorraine Massey who created the Curly Girl Method. On her Instagram account for her her curly hair care brand, she has recently made claims saying that you should not be using oils or butters, which is incredibly frustrating to me. So many curlies, particularly black women, use products that are high in butters because they are amazing to seal moisture into the hair shaft. And these women get fantastic results using these products and it honestly feels incredibly insensitive to suddenly claim that you can no longer use these products. So like I mentioned earlier, pretty much any moisturizing ingredient has the propensity to build up on your hair. Once again, all you have to do is clean it off. I recommend that everyone has a clarifying shampoo in their regimen, just clean your hair. <laughs> And quite honestly, I do want to mention, I think that the education around clarifying shampoos is a bit lacking in the hair care space in general. Prior to the Curly Girl method and going on my curly journey, I had never really heard of a clarifying shampoo, didn't really understand why I would need something like that. And I really think the onus is on brands to do a better job of like selling clarifying shampoos and making sure that people know that this should be a staple in your routine. Using a clarifying shampoo is the first thing I do anytime my hair feels like weird or off and it has fixed so many funky wash days. And once again, I always must stress, pay attention to your hair and how it feels. So if your hair feels like it has buildup, clarify. If your hair feels dry after you clarify, deep condition. It's just one of those things where you just got to get into the mindset of listening to your hair and giving it what it needs. Alrighty, myth number four. Certain alcohols should be avoided because they're drying. So we pretty much went through this myth in my last video, but once again, it depends on the formula. An alcohol could be used as a solvent, meaning that it's helping dissolve one of the other more moisturizing ingredients in the formula. So the formula wouldn't even come together if the alcohol wasn't present. And keep in mind that these formulators aren't trying to lie to you or dry out your hair. If a product says moisturizing on the front, it 
probably is. Myth number five is parabens should be avoided. Now this one I went on a like three minute rant on in my last video, so please watch that. But long story short, parabens are safe. They are one of the safest, most well-researched preservatives out there with one of the lowest rates of allergic reaction as compared to other preservatives. There's a lot of misinformation about parabens out there, so I'm actually going to link a Lab Muffin Beauty Science article on parabens that I send to everyone who tells me that parabens are unsafe. They're safe. Myth number six, plant-based chemical-free products are safest. Synthetic ingredients are more likely to be toxic. For this one, we're gonna start with a test. So here I have an ingredients list, and I want you to tell me, is this something that you would feel comfortable eating? What about giving to your children? Is this something that you would feel comfortable rubbing on your face? So this is actually the chemical makeup of a banana. And what I'm trying to get at here is that everything is made up of chemicals. There's actually no such thing as a chemical-free product. In fact, the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK has actually put out a reward for one million pounds if someone can formulate a chemical-free product. Because you can't. It's impossible. So stop saying that you're using products that are chemical-free. Everything is made of chemicals. Next, whether an ingredient is plant-based or synthetic says nothing about its safety or effectiveness. And also keep in mind that just because a product is plant-based doesn't mean it's green. In fact, synthetic ingredients are often the greener option. The safety of a product depends on the concentration of each ingredient and the quality of the ingredients. Really keep in mind, concentration is important here. To give an example, I can eat soy sauce every single day. Totally healthy, and safe. But if I drink an entire bottle of soy sauce, my nervous system is going to shut down. You're not going to see a warning on the label that says, may cause nervous system disruption, because the concentration that I normally use it at is perfectly healthy and fine. And a lot of this misinformation about ingredients is really coming from the same two places, Think Dirty and the EWG. Many of the cosmetic scientists that I follow and have spoken to have said time and time again that both of these are not trustworthy sources. Both of these sites take studies out of context, ignore concentration, and really just contribute to a lot of the fear-mongering that's going on in the beauty industry today. For more information on the EWG and Think Dirty, I'm also going to link more information in the description box below. If you haven't gotten it already, there's going to be a lot in there. So lastly, if none of these ingredients are bad, how the heck are we supposed to find products that are good. So it really just comes down to experimentation. Just like with any other Curly Girl approved product, you just have to figure out what works best for you. There are tons of Curly Girl approved products that I've used that I've hated. Just because a product is for curly hair doesn't mean it's going to work well. So no matter what, if you're following the Curly Girl method or not, you have to experiment. Take recommendations from your favorite curly accounts. When I look for products, I'm still kind of doing the same thing I always was doing. So I like products that have a good amount of protein and I tend to like products that have a lot of humectants. Either way, there's a lot of experimentation that's been going on on my end. It would be the same for you. And if you guys do not already follow me on Instagram at Brick Curls, I'm going to be using the hashtag unrestricted curls every time I track a wash that's using non-CG approved products. There's been a fair amount of curlies who have already started to use this hashtag, but this way we can all kind of information share to see what products are working and what's not. But I really just want to stress that companies that are using fear-mongering as a sales tactic shouldn't have our full trust. I'm always more interested about what's in a product versus what's not. I don't want to see this free from labeling on the front. What I want to see is what makes the product great. What is going to make it work well for my hair? That's what I look for. So drop me a comment down below if you learned something new today. I would love to know if I've gotten any light bulbs to go off for any of you guys. And if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, night, whatever time it is. It's 2.03 a.m. for me, and I'll see you guys soon.